Well, good morning, everybody. Um, for those of you in the room, it looks like uh, you made the wise decision to beat the traffic. I hear that it's terrible out there this morning, and by the few empty seats I see, uh, we'll probably have a few more people sneaking in. Um, I do have a few uh, housekeeping things. I want to mention a few things about uh, CEUs and sort of participation if you're in the room or if you're participating online before we get started. And I'll try to be brief because we've got a lot of stuff today. Um, so we kind of um, wanted to do this novel workshop that would allow CEU um, uh, sort of accumulation, all your ethics and supervision CEUs in, in one swoop. And I know that everybody loves that. To that point, to get your CEUs, you'll have to complete uh, an evaluation and a quiz for each segment. Um, and uh, for obvious reasons, I don't like to send those out ahead of time because there's always a few people who sort of jump the gun. So at lunch, I'll send out the uh, links to complete those uh, to everybody's uh, email or the email that you entered when you registered. Uh, and then at the end of the day, I'll send the links for the second segment. And those will be for, uh, again, both the evaluation and the quiz. You have to complete both and double check your uh, email because there's always somebody who fat fingers an extra M on gmail.com and then they worry that they've lost their CEU certificate. Um, so I'll send those links. If you uh, have any questions or if you're panicked, I haven't gotten this yet, uh, I'm worried about you know my score on the quiz, don't panic, just email me and we'll figure it out. My email is kobelund at datafinch.com. It's C-O-B as in boy, Y, L-U-N as in November, D as in December, at datafinch.com. Okay, so if you're in the room, uh, make sure that you signed up for lunch. We're going to try and keep lunch at a reasonable amount of time, so we're um, getting a variety of, of, of things in here for lunch. And if you have a question for Dr. Bailey uh, as we go along, you need to use the mic because there's 150 people online and they won't hear your question if you don't use the mic. So if you have a question, just raise your hand and, and I'll bring you uh, the mic to ask your question. If you're online, you should see at the bottom a place where it says ask a question to the presenter or ask the presenter a question. Um, submit any of the questions that you want Dr. Bailey to answer there uh, and I'll ask them uh, in the room. If you have any tech problems, you can log into uh, datafinch.com and send a chat. They'll help you uh, with your tech problems. And just real quickly, um, uh, before I introduce Dr. Bailey, it, I always kind of like to um, uh, poll the online crowd to see who's here. Um, and our winners, three that I want to mention specifically, we have Esther from the Netherlands right now, uh, Simon from France, uh, maybe Simone, I'm not sure, but Simon or Simone from France, I realize that's kind of a big difference, but we have someone from France, um, and Razan, I think I'm saying that right, or Razan from Saudi Arabia. He said it's uh, 5 p.m. there, so he's going to stay up till 2 a.m. Um, uh, and uh, participate. So let's get started. Um, it, Dr. Bailey is literally the definition of a behavior analyst who doesn't need an introduction. He it has quite literally, um, you know, served on every board and been president of all the relevant organizations. Um, He's probably lost more awards than the rest of us will win, you know, in our entire lives. Um, we were talking a little bit before we started. He's produced 63 PhDs in his career, uh, many of whom have gone on to uh, quite a bit of uh, acclaim themselves, um, and 240 master's level BCBAs-ish, so <laughs> a little bit more than 240 master's level BCBAs. and. Uh, that program uh, has the best rating from the, um, the uh, BACB for passing the test. There's never been uh, one of those graduates who's failed the BACB exam. Um, I was telling him that's kind of a lot of pressure for incoming students, right? You don't want to be the first student of Dr. Bailey's to fail uh, that exam. You might as well just go on and, you know, be a dentist or something. Um, so uh, part of what's really cool about having Dr. Bailey here is um, in his retirement, his, in his retirement, I, I seem to remember we had a party. <laughs> um, in his retirement, he's really gone on to become the foremost ethicist in our field. 
Um, I'm sure many of you have had the same experience. We literally have these, what would John do moments. When we have dilemmas, kind of the best check is to stop and think, what would, what would Dr. Bailey do in this situation and, and try and act accordingly? So we're really excited about this. Um, I mentioned that uh, we'll have a few breaks and we'll break for lunch, but it's, it's totally up to Dr. Bailey. We're just gonna uh, kind of ride the wave here. So um, without further ado, we'll get started. Good morning. Just one, one correction. Um, I'm very proud of our master's program. It's been in existence for 15 years. And um, the, latest <coughs> the latest ranking showed that our class of 2014, which was the most recent class that the board keeps track of that way, uh, they got the 100%. So, uh, I didn't want you to think that every class gets 100%, but we're in the 90s, which is pretty close. We had a, um, a celebration of this event at the last FABA conference. Uh, I commissioned a, a, a logo for the event and had it made into a pen, and we had a pinning ceremony. So we had a banquet, and we called out the names one by one, and the students that were in the 100% group that made us number one uh, they came up and they didn't know what they were getting into because that was the first time we'd ever done it so we sort of kept it quiet so they walked up and uh, Amy Pollack our uh, new faculty member new as of three or four years ago um, she pinned them <coughs> they walked over to where I was standing and I gave them a uh, glass plaque that was etched with the logo on there and I said hold it like this so nobody can see what it is and then they filed over this way. So we had, I think, um, 14 students show up out of the 17 that took the exam. So they were all lined up over there and people in the audience were looking, what's going on? They couldn't see the pens from where they were. And I said, uh, big reveal. So everybody held up their plaque and then everybody was excited and so on. And uh, everybody wants now to get one of those because they're precious. And the only way you can get one, it's kind of a group contingency is to encourage your colleagues to work hard and pass the test. So uh, we're looking forward to that. I'm really uh, excited about uh, uh, what that's going to look like in the future. And I'm excited to be here uh, to see alums of our program and uh, alums of my PhD program. It's like homecoming, sort of. So I'm glad to be here. Uh, so the, the uh, morning session is on supervision. And the subtitle is Assumptions, Ethics, and Best Practices. And according to a recent ruling by the board, uh, this session can either be counted by you as your supervision hours or your ethics hours. So uh, you can choose. I didn't realize that that's how that worked. But uh, so theoretically, you could get seven ethics hours today if you wanted to, or you could get three and four. Uh, I got interested in supervision um, a couple years ago when one of my former students approached me at ABBA and said she wanted to do her dissertation on a topic related to supervision <coughs> and uh, wanted to know if I could give her some tips. And the more I talked to her about what the tips would be, the more I realized that um, this wasn't just a conversation. So I said to her, she got her master's degree with us about five, six years ago. She went to uh, Nova University down in Fort Lauderdale. <coughs> and I said, um, I think this is a long-term project. And if, uh, and if you really want to do this, I'll be happy to coach you through this whole thing. But you've got to come to Tallahassee. And she said, OK. And I said, we have research meeting every two weeks, just like we did when the doctoral students were in place. And uh, she said, I'll do that. So for the last uh, two and a half, going, actually going on three years, uh, she's driven from Fort Lauderdale to Tallahassee every other week for these research meetings, specifically about the question of supervision. And what is it? How do you quantify it? How do you improve it? Lots of things related to supervision. Are there supervisors in the room? Anybody here is a supervisor? 
Okay, a few. Anybody who's planning to be a supervisor? Okay, a couple, okay. <clears throat> so, um, for those of you that aren't supervisors, are you a supervisee? Anybody a supervisee? I've got a supervisee. Um, I, th I hope that this will be enlightening as to what we have come up with with regard to what supervision is. So that's what this is about. Uh, by the way, if you need to uh, contact me with ethics questions or whatever questions, that's the address. Uh, and I take, uh, I take those questions regularly from people, from uh, former students, people I meet at workshops like this, and also the uh, ABAI hotline. I take uh, questions from that hotline. So if you can't remember the address, just go to the ABAI. Look in the upper right-hand corner. They've put, moved it up there. It says uh, Ethics Hotline. Click on that. Whatever you write will come to me, and I'll try to help you out. So uh, this is the pro forma that's required by the board to say that this, is, uh, uh, this meets the requirements uh, for those uh, uh, pursuing uh, training and supervision. So uh, did I understand him to say 150 people were here? That's unbelievable from around the world. I was going to ask which countries, but he already called out a few, and so uh, we probably have somebody in nearly everywhere, I guess, is what that amounts to. I guess some of them in the United States, too. Um, so uh, a lot of people there. How about in the room? Everybody here is from Atlanta? Anybody from outside Atlanta? No, everybody's here. Okay. So uh, my, uh, this student that I've been working with, <clears throat> I call her my student, but I'm, she's not really my student because she's getting her degree in another department at another university, and she actually has a major professor who uh, kind of willed her to me and said, go ahead, take it. Uh, she gets the credit, but I get the fun of uh, working with Ulema on this. <clears throat> so we started with just asking basic questions about supervision, what is supervision, and so on, and uh, that caused me to think about, well, what, how long has this been around? Because there was a time early in this field, and I can tell you I've been around since the early part of this field, and we didn't talk about supervision back in the old days. I got my uh, PhD in 1970, and nobody talked about supervision then, and that was way before the board uh, existed. Uh, people called themselves behavior analysts and they did behavior analysis. That's pretty much what it was. Uh, it would be inappropriate to call it the Wild West because people weren't acting inappropriately, uh, but there really wasn't any regulation of what it was. People got, got a degree mostly in experimental psychology. They applied what they knew to uh, clinical settings. They did the best they could. So. Uh, uh, it occurs to me that we could start with a very basic question of what is supervision. And my good friend Wiki, uh, probably you know her too, Wikipedia, uh, helps out a lot with stuff like this because uh, this, this is a crowdsourced uh, information, so a lot of people had a chance to talk about this. So if you look at the term supervision and you think about uh, other people that use that term and have used it uh, before we did, so... Uh, uh, a, a foreman, like on a construction site, uh, a, a boss, an overseer, uh, a facilitator, a coordinator, these are all uh, names for it. And uh, they say that this is the job title of a low-level management position. So those of you that were thinking about becoming a supervisor might want to think of something else. Um, and those of the, you that are supervisors, there's hope. Just stick with me here on this. Now, here's a key point about supervision that some people forget, and that is, uh, uh, by definition, a supervisor has control over things. There's some authority granted to somebody who is a supervisor, and in particular, uh, the fact that the supervisor is responsible for what's going on. Um, I'll make a distinction between uh, supervision, a supervisor and a consultant here in a little while. Uh, but, and this comes from uh, uh, Ministry of Labor in Ontario, that's their definition. It looks very much like the U.S. definition. So, uh, a, a supervisor gives instructions to subordinates, 
uh, can be held responsible for the work and actions of the employee. This is really critical. Uh, and I think this is the part that the board uh, finally noticed uh, in the last edition, the last iteration of the Code of Ethics, uh, was that uh, supervision didn't mean give me your paperwork, I'll sign it. It meant I know what you're doing and I want you to do it right because if it doesn't go right, I'm responsible. It's on my head. And I think that they noticed that and that's, we'll get into the changes in the code relative to uh, supervision uh, later on, but uh, the idea of uh, uh, treating supervision of, of behavior analyst supervisees, uh, which is to say uh, the students or BCABAs, treating that lightly as sort of a paperwork burden, that's gone uh, because now serious things could happen and uh, you've got to be a serious supervisor to take care of them. Supervisor, first and foremost, an overseer whose main responsibility to, is to assure a group of subordinates get the assigned amount of production and when they're supposed to and acceptable levels of cost. Obviously, that's for uh, a uh, production line where you have supervisors and so on. Although, it could very well apply in behavior analysis where the supervisor actually makes assignments to supervisees as to caseload and so on. Whoops. The nice thing about uh, uh, Wiki is she tells you how to pronounce things. <laughs> uh, a manager, a director, overseer, controller, superintendent, governor, chief, head, and more. So uh, that first definition that said it was a low-level job, now it's been elevated to governor. So uh, you can you know, feel better about that. Uh, when when uh, Ulima, my student, and I got into this thing about uh, supervision, uh, uh, people in our field have just accepted that um, if you're a behavior analyst, you need supervision. That is, recently and because of the board, uh, people have accepted that. But uh, um, the term's been around for a good long while. And I think it's important to get that perspective on it. Uh, if you go to Google, uh, you can type in a key word and it'll tell you the frequency of the use of that word. So uh, the term supervisor really didn't occur much back in here, in the written, at least in the written literature. Uh, it increased in the uh, 30s and 40s, peaked in the 50s, and uh, maybe on a downtrend. I'm not sure what that means for us. Uh, I guess if we're going to keep up, we're going to have to come up with another term uh, for this. But, uh, uh, but uh, you can see that the serious use of the term uh, happens in about uh, 1910, 20, back in there. I think probably the first supervisors were the uh, pyramid builders. Uh, and uh, sadly, the people who were actually doing the heavy lifting on that probably needed supervision. Uh, in the sense of uh, uh, control, because if they were just left to their own devices, they probably wouldn't do that. So uh, that this person is a supervisor who knows how to use uh, negative reinforcement, I'm sure. Then when we get to the Industrial Revolution, uh, that, according to the history of this, um, that's when there got to be a need for supervisors because when you have an agrarian economy, uh, farmers don't need supervision because Mother Nature is the supervisor and if you don't plant your crops at the right time and the right soil, whatever it is, then uh, uh, it's, nothing's going to work out good for you. So uh, it was only when you uh, uh, pulled people from uh, uh, agricultural America into the big cities and working in big industries that you needed supervision. And of course, uh, many of the employees were children. And like the pyramid builders, children needed some supervision too. Because my guess is they would rather fool around than uh, uh, weave, make carpets and so on. You can see the spindles in there. So that's the supervisor and those are the kids. And um, that's a real photo. Have we come a long way? Is it the case that we don't employ 13 year olds anymore? 
I don't know, according to Silicon Valley, some of the computer whizzes out there are like 16, 17, something like that. It's amazing. Interestingly, because of that, because of bringing kids into the workplace, because there were no child labor laws at that time, uh, the, the profession of social work came into existence because they then had to uh, provide for many of these kids because the parents uh, uh, had bad outcomes working in industry and now you've got these orphans and these orphans need uh, care and so on so the field of social work uh, came about and uh, they brought uh, supervision into the human services they, they had the idea that uh, if you're going to have social workers working with kids the social workers have to have a supervisor so they handle the right cases in the right time and so on so our lineage of the term of the use of the term supervision goes back a long ways and if you look at it uh, it came into existence before behavior analysis was ever thought of nobody knew anything about behavior analysis in those days anybody recognize this gentleman think general psych this gentleman is connected to uh, all of us through supervision this is Freud and uh, some of his students and one of his students uh, this gentleman with uh, unfortunate mustache <laughs> Max Eddington uh, he came up with the idea this is psychoanalysis he came up with the idea that if you're going to train students in psychoanalysis that they'll have to be supervised and so he gets credit for bringing the concept of supervision into this as a formal requirement uh, in psychoanalysis. So uh, you can trace your roots of supervision and behavior analysis from uh, Freud through social work, uh, the Industrial Revolution, and back to the pyramids. So does that make you feel good that you're part of history now? You can think of that whole train of history. So then, uh, Ulima, we, in our discussions that we would have every other week, uh, we started bringing up, uh, well, wait a minute, when did this happen? When did supervision happen in behavior analysis? And so we started uh, thinking about that. And uh, my tendency is to think of it based on the field that we know, which is we're evidence-based. Um, we have uh, empirical studies. Everything we do is uh, based on the science of behavior and so on. Uh, so uh, we, we got into this discussion about, and, and for her dissertation, she needed to uh, do the research on supervision. So um, I sent her off to JABA uh, first thing and said, uh, just it's easy, just go to the website, the Wiley website, and type in supervision, and you'll find the history of supervision in behavior analysis there because all the studies on supervision will be there and you can just go back and find the earliest one and you know that's going to really help you with your lit review so there's the website and and uh, you can go there too it's there's no charge or anything uh, you click on in this journal which is Java type in the term supervision which uh, we did Tim Vollmer was uh, editor back when uh, did this. Actually, he may still be this. I'm not sure if he still is the editor or not. So, uh, uh, I was expecting to get a pretty good list of all of the studies uh, in JABA on supervision. And supervision is, is a pretty tight key term. So uh, there's some terms that if you want to find out about, uh, you kind of have to work around the edges. But supervision is the core key term of this field. So um, I got a list, and I brought it to the next uh, research meeting that we had. And I said, um, Ulema, you've really got your work cut out for you. Here's the list of all of the studies in JABA. You're going to have to look up all these studies and relate those to what you're about to do. So uh, 
this relates to all the BCABAs who deliver behavior analytic services and those who are pursuing uh, BACB who want to have a, a wide net. So here's all the studies. I was flabbergasted. I had to do it again, make sure I didn't make a mistake. But it turns out, in terms of studies with the word supervision in the title, or keywords attributed by the author, so it could have some other kind of title, but the keywords, if it was one of the keywords, it's not there either. So she was happy to see this, um, but uh, when she shared that with her chair, uh, which is to say, you know, I don't looks like I don't have to do much in the way of a, a review of the literature because it really doesn't seem to be any. That didn't fly. Uh, and uh, what she had to do was uh, review supervision everywhere else. So it got to be a long, a long thing. <coughs> I think what we should be using, if we're going to have a concept of supervision, a field of supervision, is we ought to have uh, a, an empirical basis for what we do by way of supervision. And it looks like we're starting from scratch. So, um, it looks to me like everything that we're working with now, uh, in, t in terms of what we call supervision, really are extrapolations from other things that we think we know. Uh, like, uh, when I went back and did this several times and I started typing in other terms, it turns out that there is a, a field called staff management uh, that uh, involves supervising people, but the people they're supervising them aren't behavior analysts. They're direct care staff, for the most part. So it kind of gives you some inkling about what that would look like, but it's not our field. It's not behavior analysis. And there's some studies uh, that are more clinical in nature that have to do with um, like uh, training parents, uh, giving them feedback and so on. And that sort of looks like supervision, but the parents aren't behavior analysts either. So uh, the, the term best practice comes to mind uh, when we get into this thing, we start thinking about supervision and ask the question, what is best practice? And uh, th that term is appropriate for almost everything else you do. Uh, if you were working with a child that had a feeding disorder, uh, you wouldn't want to just sit there and scratch your head or some other part of your anatomy and, and come up with something, you, you would go to the literature and you'd find out what's the best way to treat this. That's the ethical thing to do from all, all of our perspective. You'd be using whatever the research shows. Uh, same thing goes with uh, self-injurious behavior. Same thing goes for hair pulling. Anything, anything like that, you'd want to use the best practice. You'd want to know what that is. And right now, uh, we don't have uh, a, a literature on the best practice and furthermore we don't even know exactly what it would look like because we don't even know how supervision is defined behaviorally. So I uh, c came to this conclusion uh, and uh, again one of these research meeting discussions where we're talking about um, uh, okay Yulima you want to talk about your project? And uh, then I would talk to her and you know how the research meeting goes. We interact and we question and we quiz each other and challenge each other and so on. And it dawned on me when I was kind of boring down on, well, wait a minute, if you're going to do research on this, you're going to have to define what supervision is. You can't just say, well, everybody knows what it is. Well, why do we have to define it? You have to actually define it. And then it dawned on me this is going to be hard because it's not a behavioral term. We have our behavioral terms. We know what behavioral terms look like, like reinforcer. That, that doesn't exist in the common vernacular. Uh, uh, the term reinforcer, uh, reward does, but uh, that doesn't exist. The word operant, outside of our little group, nobody knows what an operant is. In fact, it's a good way to kind of sort out people. <laughs> So, you know, you get in some conversations, well, so what is your operant level anyway? And if they go, what? Then you know they're not behaviorally trained. Um, and if they go, oh, well, uh, on what dependent variable? Uh, you want to know my heart rate? 
You want to know how fast I run? You want to know how many stairs I climb per day? What? And if you get that, you know that you're dealing with a, another behavior analyst. Manned, nobody does that term. And if you compare just those three with supervision, everybody talks about supervision. But you can see that it doesn't have the same characteristic. Each of these can be defined with a, um, an operational defini definition. So each one of these can be carefully defined, replicated, uh, and so on. Nobody says antecedent but us. That's our term. We know how to define that. Punishment, uh, that term is used by other people, but doesn't have the same meaning that, uh, that we have. And, and uh, uh, those of you that work out in the world uh, know that that's true. Uh, most people think of punishment as what you do to criminals and bad people, but they don't think of it as a way of uh, decelerating a rate of response over time. It's like, no, no, what? No. Uh, and, and they don't think of, you know, we put anything that decelerates a behavior over time, uh, we put that in the category of a punisher. Uh, but other people would, they would say no. So why are you arguing with your spouse? Why are you punishing your spouse? Oh, I'm not punishing him. Yeah, you are. Really, that's exactly what you're doing. Uh, the rate of behavior is going down. Have, have you noticed that he comes home from work a little bit later every day? A little bit later every day? Why do you think that is? Well, I don't know. No, it's because of punishment. No. Anyway, consequence, that's another one that, uh, uh, other than some TV shows and uh, uh, and Dick Cheney, uh, I don't know if you knew this, Dick Cheney knew the word consequence. Uh, he, he had, as one of his speeches, he included this sentence, behaviors have consequences. And I thought, oh my God, he's been reading Skinner. Uh, <laughs> but no, he was talking about world events and you know what happens when you uh, uh, take over a foreign country and then leave. And uh, that was what he was talking about. Fixed ratio, that's our term, uh, evidence-based term, DRO. Uh, nobody knows what that is but us. Fixed interval, nobody knows what that is. Timeout, uh, Dr. Phil has sort of uh, co-opted timeout so it doesn't belong to us much anymore. Uh, and he uses it in all kinds of ways, uh, inconsistent. Uh, but it's, it's pretty clear that uh, from our point of view, we know exactly what timeout is. And if somebody said they used it, you would ask them, give me the, def what's your definition of it? Because you'd want to know exactly how they used it. Tact, chaining. Um, so these are all our terms, our words operationally defined. And I would argue that supervision doesn't fit there because it's not operationally defined. So what is supervision in ABA? I'm going to give you a working definition, and then a little bit later I'm going to refine that uh, as we go on. So I'm going to propose uh, this definition, that supervision is a systematic method of changing task-related behavior in ABA trainees and practicing BCABAs. Kobe, do they have the handouts for this, the guided notes? Everybody got guided notes? Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, now, a systematic a method of changing task-related behaviors in ABA trainees, and that's pretty tight, I would say, for a start, because it, sa it says that supervision uh, has to do with changing behavior. So a supervisor is somebody who changes behavior and does it in a systematic fashion. And uh, I think we can use that to sort of get started uh, with where we want to go with this. That term, supervision, can be used uh, for acquisition behaviors, changing behavior over time. So if this was, if this was the behavior of a supervisee and uh, you were trying to teach that supervisee some behavior uh, using behavioral skills training, which is our standard package. Uh, you can use it, you can use that term defined that way 
to cover that situation. Or you can use it to cover maintenance over time. So the, the, the working definition so far covers acquisition and maintenance of behavior. And those are the, pretty much the two things that we do for the most part. Uh, I left out uh, deceleration of behavior, which would be the, the opposite. But um, uh, we don't, in the literal sense of using a punisher to decelerate, we don't do that too much. And by the way, feel free to uh, ask any questions uh, as we go along. I'm, this isn't intended to be a long day's workshop. It's intended to be a conversation and you can ask questions and uh, that sort of thing. And also, I'm gonna uh, uh, work real hard to give you a break every 50 minutes. So, uh, if I forget that, Kobe, can you remind me that we'll do that? I'm drinking a lot of coffee, so I'll All right, good, okay. So, how are we doing so far? Anybody got any questions? Okay. According to the, uh, the board, uh, there's two types of supervision. One is management of BCABAs. So there is a, this is a kind of a prototypical uh, table of organization with a CEO, a director of clinical services, meaning behavioral services, director of operations, and the clinical services director who is a BCABA would then be supervising a certain number of uh, uh, BCBA, supervising a certain number of BCABAs. So supervision type one involves this. So uh, if you have a BCBA and you work in an organization and you have a number of BCABAs, then they require supervision uh, according to the, the code. They can't be allowed to just do whatever they want. And uh, the, according to the, the working definition, the job of the supervisor is to monitor closely what they do and bring them into uh, alignment with best practices in the field, assuming that the supervisor knows what that is and that's their job. And then once the BCABAs have been brought into that alignment, to keep them there in terms of maintenance. So that's uh, type one. And this person, this supervisor, is essentially in charge of uh, the quality of client services. If something goes wrong down there with a BCABA, the BCBA supervisor is held responsible. Uh, the individual person would have some accounting to do as well, but this person is going to have to be in charge of that. If anything goes, especially if something goes bad down here, they're going to catch it. And they should because they're in charge. And they can't write it off. It's like, well, you know, she's been around here for four or five years. I didn't feel like I needed to look over her shoulder. Uh, yeah, you do. Type two, uh, and this has to do with uh, uh, trainees. Uh, these are people who, according to the board, uh, need to accumulate a some, certain number of uh, uh, practicum hours. Does that mean a question? Yeah, okay, there's, a, uh, there's an online question. Um, can you define ABA trainees? Would this include teachers, paraprofessionals who are working with students in an ABA-based classroom? Yeah, I don't think your mic's on. I'm sorry, can you define ABA trainees and would this include teachers and paraprofessionals working with students in an ABA-based classroom? Uh, that they probably wouldn't be trainees unless they were in a, um, a master's program, a graduate program of some kind, uh, and were accumulating their hours. Uh, I think the, the individuals that you were describing there, teachers and so on, that would be more of the type one. Uh, so this is uh, supervision within an organization. Does that look like that? Okay. So if you're, uh, if you're working with trainees, which I do, although I'm not literally their supervisor, but all of the master's students in our uh, program are trainees for the couple years that we have them, and they have to get uh, 1,000 hours, 1,500 hours, whatever it is, whichever one they're doing, uh, and they have to get a certain amount of supervision per week. 
So uh, you have an approved supervisor, and uh, those of you that are in the, in the scheme of things, you know that uh, that got nailed down about, was it a year ago, year and a half ago, where if you're going to be a supervisor, you have to take this eight hours of, pres of prescribed coursework. Then you have to do a one hour uh, with the board, so you have a total of those nine hours and so on, and then you can be uh, called a supervisor. Uh, and then that supervisor has a certain number of trainees. Now this is, to me, this is a very important responsibility to, to work with these people because this is the next generation. And if we don't get this right, we're going to be in trouble. If, if these individuals, these trainees, are allowed to get by with lax standards and uh, to develop bad habits about how they handle customer service or how they follow through with clients or whatever it is, uh, if they don't get that right, I don't know that they're necessarily going to improve once they graduate. Because once you're a BCBA, according to the rule, you don't require supervision. You're on your own. It's sort of like being a licensed psychologist. <coughs> once you're a licensed psychologist, nobody supervises you except for your board. And the same thing goes in our field. Once you're a BCBA, you're only accountable to the uh, certification board. And then only if somebody happens to report you. We'll talk a little bit about that later on. So uh, these examples come from the, uh, uh, the certification board. Uh, this is where uh, the trainees are learning uh, client improvement methods, how to conceptualize a case, uh, how to ask for help when they need it, how to solve problems, how to make decisions. Uh, improving the repertoire, not only their repertoire, but the repertoire of their clients. Uh, and uh, they're learning about good supervision because it's being modeled for them on a regular basis. I think this is, the, I think this is a really important task. And somebody who takes on the task of being a supervisor of trainees that is to say, uh, students in uh, master's programs are going to become board certified and so on. I think this is an incredibly important part of, the, of our field. And I think these people really need to be carefully uh, chosen, carefully trained, and supervised. If you want somebody to be a really good supervisor, you're going to have to have somebody supervise them so they can become a good supervisor. And that's where we're going to get in a little bit later to the, um, to the research on this because we, it took us a while to figure it out, but then we figured, oh, that's the missing piece. So we'll get there. <laughs>